In today's video, Alex and I go over a question that has been plaguing us for a very long time, and that's should women train chess? Don't forget, if you're listening to this on Monday, Banty's launch in two days on Wednesday, July 19th at noon EST. So make sure that you're signed up for the email list if you want to see them on Tuesday. But otherwise, we'll catch you guys on Wednesday. Share this with a friend, and we'll see you on the inside. Alex, you asked me a really great question this weekend, and I really am not convinced on the total answer because the way that you answered it when you were looking it up on Google felt like you were still very unsure of it. But you asked me, what do I think the most common car color is? I voted black because black is likely right still. I'm holding on to that. But you said what color? White. And, you know, the only reason I do think that he is correct on this is because of vans, of like working vans, not semis or anything, but those are still counted as cars. So that would be the only thing I could see you possibly winning on that. But working vans, working trucks, I think I think white is well ahead from a I could get clipped right there, but. (laughs) White is well ahead from a car color standpoint. But like every car comes in black, not every car comes in white. I mean, are you the car color police? I'm Maybe. pretty sure. I mean, they but Look every up a car, Honda Accord. Does that come in white? For sure comes in Look white. Look it up. Uh, it's, it's not necessary. Oh, I'm sure it okay, is. okay. Honda Accord, um, Camry, all the main cars, your mainstay, run-of-the-mill cars all come in black and white. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Do you have anything else that you uh, are wondering about as far as the whole world? Are there more wheels or doors? <laughs> are there Probably more... wheels because there's like two-door cars. I don't know. That are four-seaters. What about 18-wheeler cars? That too. So there's even more wheels. Oh. <laughs> there's lots of wheels on those. <laughs> I think that is the... I think it's wheels or doors or it's like wheels or windows. Maybe it's wheels or windows. Hmm. What do you think? I'm not sure. More wheels or windows in the world? Does the, in the whole world? In the U.S. Are we talking about just on cars or like? In general. Well, that's, I don't even know. That would say windows then. Okay. (laughs) I'm still going wheels. Okay. (laughs) If we're saying on cars, then wheels. Unless, do Does like that small sliver of window count as an extra window on cars? Did you just call it a window? (laughs) Maybe. I'd call it a window. Uh, Well, you were saying wheels win, so. I honestly have no idea, and it really doesn't matter, but I'm curious about it. (laughs) Well, I was curious if you wanted to know how to look more aesthetic, burn more calories, have better posture, prevent injuries, and more all at the same time. I'm so curious. What? does that training your chest wow really (laughs) and i know that it's pretty common that women don't want to train their chest they don't want to have these huge pecs or look too manly so i thought that we could dive into that today and talk about the aesthetic side of it the function side and really just learn about if women should even train chest i have been trying to grow my chest my entire life. It's been a weak point since I started training. And so if any of the women who are concerned about getting this big bulky chest can give me some tips, (laughs) I would love to hear them because I need some help. Mm -hmm. I think that that's probably the most interesting part is with any muscle group, sometimes people get afraid of if I pick up any weight, all of a sudden this muscle is going to pop out. And I would love to know the secrets because I have been intentionally working and eating to grow certain muscle groups, and that's still not the case. And I think that's one really important note of talking on growing is the difference between a growth or a bias for a muscle group versus having just maintenance volume in place for a group. So I thought that we could dive into that a little bit more and talk about when you're trying to truly grow versus just being able to have enough volume to maintain the muscle that you have currently. I think that we often get caught in just the visual appearance of the tissue. And if we train, it means that we're putting on more tissue. 
and not paying attention to just the function of the muscle as well as supporting the muscle groups that you're wanting to grow. Because oftentimes when I see a client come in that does not want to train their chest, they want big shoulders and they want um, a strong back and strong lats. Well, to have those things, we're going to have to have at least some strength and stability being provided by that chest tissue. And so having that function is a really important piece and not just looking at the aesthetic gain that you would have have from growing muscle tissue is really important. Is there a difference between how you set up your training if you are trying to really grow a muscle group versus just being able to keep the same size? Yeah, I, I think that this is a debate at the moment within the hypertrophy community, the science-based community of, is it volume that is the main driver of, of growing muscle tissue or is it intensity in which you're training that's going to drive muscle growth? And I think that it's going to fall in the middle. I, I think that the total quantity of volume that you're training at a high intensity is going to elicit the threshold of growth that you're desiring. And so for the individual who is just wanting to have maintenance of the muscle tissue that they have or just improve the overall function, I'm going to focus on a handful of things. The uh, overall range of motion that they're able to achieve while training the muscle is really important. So being able to train in more of a lengthened bias position where the insertion and the origin of the tissue is as far away from one another as possible, as well as having stability and strength in the shortened position where that insertion and the origin are as close together as possible. And having that functionality throughout their training program, not to a point in which we're gathering this large quantity of volume to where that tissue is getting more dense and we're having greater hypertrophy as a whole, but we are still having that improved overall function and support for the other tissues that it's playing a role in. Going back to something you mentioned earlier, as far as if you are wanting to have bigger delts and a bigger back, why do people need to train chest if that's the case? If they're going for those other muscle groups, why is it important that chest is still in play? This can be more of a conversation between the two of us because I think that there are multiple things that we can speak to within the overall function of the tissue itself because one thing that I see within clients when they are not training chest and they're hammering away at the overhead press, for example, and lateral raises and doing a lot of upper back work is that their chest is very tight. And so they see themselves like kind of with this concaved mm -hmm. look as well as discomfort through their chest of like their shoulders are rolled forward and they're just like, I can't really open myself up. I, I feel like I'm just chronically having my shoulders rolling forward because of that lack of, lack of strength and stability through their chest while the other muscle groups are trying to grow and trying to function properly. They see that limitation and present itself through the posture and that rounding forward of the shoulders. Another thing I see with that shoulder rounding forward is not only pain because your posture is really bad and that's going to carry over to when you're sitting at your desk or sitting watching TV, but it doesn't really allow for that scapula to fully fan out. And so then you start to see shoulder impingements happening. And oftentimes clients need to take multiple steps back before they can even move properly to see more progress, even if they don't have that goal of growing their chest because it has caused shoulder issues. And then in turn, they've been pounding against it and still going after their back. And then it's causing movement pattern issues because you've tried to compensate with other muscles because you don't have that strength through your chest. I agree with that. And another thing that I often see is when clients come in with a breast augmentation, mm -hmm. they've either been advised from their doctor to train chest or completely avoid chest. It's There's no like standard to this. I think that every surgeon has their own thought process, which is fine. Um, and so they may come in and say that they're, they can't train chest. It's uncomfortable to train chest. And this oftentimes leads to a number of issues. I find this to really be the the rounding of the shoulders but also with the pec minor and it's it's role in uh, breathing and inhaling properly. And so we want to still be able to train that pec minor specifically, but also being able to utilize some of the upper pec fibers as a whole, just to have some incline pressing to provide some of that stability, um, as well as avoid some of those shoulder impingements and the rounding of the shoulders forward or the lack of strength through that pec minor, different things like that. Just having that little base of training volume biased 
focused towards your chest is going to be such a big help to the overall function of your upper body. The function is definitely so important, and we're going to get into a few more things within the function, but especially if you are getting a breast augmentation, you might not care that people know you have a breast augmentation, but you also might want it to look a little bit more natural, and having some fullness in your upper chest and your delts can really help with that more natural look to a breast augmentation, and it's just going to allow your physique to be a lot more balanced, not only with your posture being better and being able to have better movement patterns from front to back, but also being able just to have some muscle tissue up here to fill you out to give you that look. And I think that with talking about function, we also need to talk about what works for people or how we get people in the door. And sometimes that is just the aesthetics or being able to look good. And so I don't think that that's something we should just shove aside and say, the function is what's important. Pay attention to it where people obviously should pay attention to it. But we also need to think about why do we get people to do things? And it's normally lining up with something that they want to. So knowing you can get the best of both worlds here of really getting that function nailed down so you feel so much better, but you can also look better too, which is such a great bonus. Do you think that there are other daily activities that your chest plays a role in as a female um, that you're you know, having to do on a day-to-day -day basis? This isn't day-to-day, -to -day, but washing your hair <laughs> is one that you are using your chest because when we're looking at what function your chest does, it has to do with moving your arms in front of you and also with those pushing movements and raising your hands above. So washing your hair is going to be a part of that. Opening a door, putting your hair up in a ponytail, all are going to be using your chest and you want that to function the best because my arms get freaking tired when I'm washing my hair sometimes, but I'm in a much better spot than I used to be. Even just holding a blow dryer or something, I feel a little bit stronger there. How often do you wash? your hair? Oh, that's a conversation for another day. Uh, I would say with it being summer and all of the pollen, I am washing it about once a week. But when I can, I try to push towards that week and a half time frame. That seems long. Is it not? Is that normal for a female to only wash their hair every 10 days? I need your guys' help because Alex is out here thinking that I, I am no idea. a maniac for not washing my hair. But look at his hair. I would I barely wash have my... any. I'm balding. <laughs> it's going. Like I've only got so much left here. I would wash my hair every single day if I had short hair or if it just styled perfectly. No, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that because then it's getting Your all dry. Oils, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Don't but for argument's sake, I would wash it every day. I remember when I donated my hair to Locks of Love and my hair was like this short, I couldn't believe how easy it was and how fast my showers got for since I had 12 inches longer of hair to going to that short hair. It was incredible. I take your donation. <laughs> Of my 12 inches of hair? I take it. You're going to grow your hair out again, get the swoop? Yeah, get some extensions put in. <laughs> Go to Turkey? Yeah. <laughs> you got to win a basketball game first. <laughs> Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. You made a great point earlier as far as a weak pec minor and impeding your breathing. And this isn't just if you do have a breast augmentation, but anyone can have a weak pec minor and it can lead to short and shallow breathing. And if you aren't breathing with your diaphragm and you're breathing with your chest or your belly, that puts you in that fight or flight, which is going to be releasing more cortisol and puts you in a spot that it's really hard to recover. And you might notice that you're dealing with inflammation constantly or just high stress, feeling like your heart rate is elevated. And that can be from not working your pecs at all and then having that super weak pec minor and not being able to get those breaths because it turns into really short and shallow breathing and actually limits your lung capacity if you can't utilize that muscle. This is actually something I've had focus on within my physical therapy work of learning to breathe better with my diaphragm. Because one thing alongside the breathing and, and putting on muscle tissue is that as your body adds that tissue, you've got to continue to strengthen that the muscles around that diaphragm to allow for it to expand and contract and um, 
that's a, it's much more challenging than you would think it is. Yes. You would think that your body just like does it because you are just breathing throughout the day and, um, it's not an issue or if it was an issue, like enough of an issue, you wouldn't be living, you know, that's your thought process. But the reality is, is that, um, I feel so much better having focused on mine and my heart rate is consistently down. I think like 10 or 12 beats per that's minute. Awesome. Since starting the work, it's not just in that, you know, solely it's multiple things, but that being a big part of it, um, as well as it allows for me to get to sleep easier. Mm -hmm. It allows for me to fall asleep easier. It allows for me to stay asleep easier. Cause I, I find that especially with clients who are maybe carrying a little bit of excess weight or have not gone through breathing practices and improved their ability to take deeper breaths in and, and exhale more deeply, um, that they run into these similar issues as well. And so just this small detail, I know it seems so almost unnecessary, yeah. but it is such a big deal and it is such a big help when you actually get it in place. I am such a big believer that if you can control your breathing, you can control basically anything. And we've had that conversation, especially when it comes to emotions and reactions. If you can just calm yourself and focus on your breathing and really breathe correctly, that can not only get you to such a more level place. And like we talked about of that heart rate coming down, but it just allows you to be a better person to be around and to make decisions. I felt that I would be making decisions based off of so much emotion because I couldn't get my breathing in check. And I know I've talked about having anxiety as well. And the breathing has really helped the anxiety. And I feel like one of those people that I used to roll my eyes at when they would say like, oh, water is the reason my skin is clear. And I'm like, breathing is the reason that I can do this. But it really is something that makes a massive difference. And I remember the day you came home from your first PT. And we've talked about also that we would love to get like an MRI or a full body scan to see what injuries you have from playing sports and just a multitude of other things going on. And you thought, oh, I have so many things that he can focus on. And you came back and you're like, we just focused on breathing the whole time. And it was also really hard to do. Yeah. I was very sore. I was very tired. I, I think I took a nap as soon as I got home because it, it was as exhausting as it was. So it's made a big difference. With you mentioning people really wanting to grow their delts, I always really opt for having more chest movements because it allows you to have some more volume to your delt training. I actually know quite a few males that don't have much direct delt training in place because they're doing so many pressing movements for their chest. They're getting all of that volume or that secondary volume to their delts. Now, I definitely do not think that you should just take out all direct delt training, but being able to add in that chest is not only going to add that fullness we talked about to your upper chest and across your whole upper body, but being able to give you some more towards your delts and specifically your front delt, your anterior delt, to give that some fullness and some volume too. And I have to throw this one in here, even if I do not want to be sitting here just telling you to do something because it burns calories. But again, if I know it's going to work, I'm going to use it. And training your chest can definitely help with burning more calories. It's a huge muscle group. And if you're not doing anything for it, then that is a huge group that you're missing out on when it comes to training. And another aspect is that when you have more muscle on your physique, you will burn more calories in general. So being able to add some volume, add some muscle tissue to your chest can help in that way too. It is summertime and with summer comes vacations and needing to look like a smoke show at the beach. And that is probably you and wanting to get in the best shape of your life. With Physique Development, our one-on-one -on -one coaching is going to do that for you. So head over to physiquedevelopment.com and inquire to work with one of our coaches. When it comes to programming or just your personal training, what are some of your favorite chest movements to throw in there? For women, I would say that it's mostly going to be incline dumbbell press. I think that that is going to be the best option for us to get the most bang for our buck, uh, especially when you talk about adding a little bit of that anterior delt volume and being able to double dip on that side of things. The incline dumbbell press, whether it be at a lower incline of maybe 20 to 30 degrees, or maybe it's at between like 50 and 60 degrees of an incline, that would be great. And then working into maybe a, uh, a cable fly of sorts that's going to 
to target more of the upper chest, whether it be a cable fly or it be a, a press around of, of sorts. That would be my favorite movements for women to perform when they're looking at their chest volume. Um, if you pr- if you enjoy a flat barbell bench press, if you enjoy a flat dumbbell bench press, by all means, go ahead and keep getting after it. I'm more so speaking to the individual that is not wanting to add chest density, but more so just improving overall function. That would be kind of my base of exercises that I would pick from. Now, what are your favorite ones? Because like you said, you've been trying to grow your chest and you definitely have grown your chest. And I know you would love- minimal success. <laughs> you love a good push day. So what are your go-to movements? I like an incline press as well, like a 20 to 30 degree incline press. And then I like a slight decline press uh, to be able to target the lower division of my pec, which is gonna be those costal fibers. Uh, Because when we're looking at the pressing, I'll get a little nerdy here with you all, is that it is dependent on that sternum angle. And so my sternum sits very low. And for me to be able to get into a place where I'm actually able to line up my chest to target those costal or those lower pec fibers, I have to be in that decline position and really make sure that I'm in alignment with those pec fibers as a whole. So both of those movements are big for me. I also really like in the prodigy rack, I have finagled my way into this (laughs) cable sternal press that I have set up that I absolutely love. And so those are probably my three favorite movements at the moment. And what are you looking at for chest machines for your dream gym? Um, I love the Nautilus horizontal press, and the plate loaded version that they do not sell any longer. Um, they sell a pin loaded version of it. It's not as good. Uh, it does not feel the same. So I love that piece. Prime, I want to, I'm trying to think of if, if Prime is maybe working on some chest press pieces off the top of my head. I, I feel like they don't have. I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm blanking on They that. have that one that was at cage. She, it's either flat or at a slight incline and it had the three different grips and it was plate loaded. Oh yeah. Yeah. They do have the, they do have the, the plate loaded presses. I'm thinking of just like pin loaded stuff, but that Nautilus piece is probably my, my number one off the top of my head with, with presses. I prefer free weights most of the time just to allow for myself to get into the best position with my shoulder and my elbow and such. Um, But that Nautilus piece lines up really nicely. What about you? What are your favorite uh, chest movements? I was trying to think while you were talking. So in case you asked me, I had an answer and I was just going to answer incline press. And I thought that that would be very lame. So in my training right now, I do have some press arounds, which I really enjoy. Uh, I really enjoy doing clavicular press, which is that higher incline press uh, for your chest. But I'm right there with you if I really prefer dumbbells. Now, I do love a good multi-grip bar if it has the right distance for me personally and it has the uh, handles at an angle, then I am all for a multi-grip bar because those are really fun because barbell just puts me in a spot where my elbows can get a little bit wonky and I'm in such a fixed position. I feel like I have a harder time executing the movement and then I do end up compensating in other ways. So being able to have that varied grip really allows me to have a lot of the same benefit as the dumbbell. But, you know, sometimes you just want to get under a bar and freaking lift something. I understand. The multi-grip bar is fun. Do you feel like there are any common mistakes people make when training chest? The common mistakes I often see are going to be people being very rigid with their scapula and like digging Mm -hmm. their shoulders into the bench and not allowing for their scapula to function properly as well as fanning out as they're pressing. And then as the weight is lowering towards them in a press, for example, they're allowing for that scapula to come in and, and have some degree of retraction at the end. And then as they're pressing out, there's going to be a very slight degree of protraction as they get to the end range of the press itself. But that scapula needs to move freely to support the pec tissue to be able to contract and to lengthen and and those different factors. And so allowing for the scapula to move freely is one of the, or not allowing for the scapula to move freely is one of the common mistakes that I see. The other is going to be the, the pressing angle that people take. And so when they're going through the press, they have the, let's say we're 
utilizing a flat dumbbell press and they just have the dumbbells out at their side and then they just press directly up rather than taking the dumbbell and pressing more towards their midline because we're trying to train the pec and with the pec one of its main functions is to take the upper arm from its or origin position and move it towards the midline or move it towards your sternum. And so if you're just simply pressing vertically and not having that degree of, of adduction to the arm, you're not training the pec to its fullest degree. And so that is something that um, I see often. And oftentimes when, when people are pressing that way, they're like, man, I feel it a ton in my shoulder. I feel like I'm having some pain or some form of impingement, or I'm getting all this tension to my shoulder and not a whole lot to my pec. And as soon as they change that arm angle and how they're pressing, um, it, it makes a big, big difference. Well, you stole my first one, but I'll allow it. Uh, for that second one, I remember you had said that Miguel and I would, if we combined our pressing movements, would make such a good pressing movement because Miguel is so good at adducting and I'm really good at just the pressing straight up and I struggle with that adduction. It's, it's really difficult if you've always done it one way and you have to constantly remind yourself to pull it over and yeah, it makes the movement a little bit more difficult, but I do feel a lot better doing it that way. I would say one of the other mistakes that I commonly see is not keeping the wrist over the elbow or generally over the elbow. There's going to be some movement there, but I see as people pressing, they're bringing the dumbbells in close to like where their shoulders are, and that's taking a lot of the tension, if not most of the tension off of the chest. And so really being able to keep those wrists over those elbows, even if your elbow is moved in a little bit, and also making sure your hand turns with that too, because people might come out to like this wide T to go ahead and press. And that I guess could be the other mistake is not knowing what part of your chest you're working or the different parts of your chest to work, which we will go ahead and have our chest playlist linked below, which shows all of our chest videos. So if you have any exercises that you're doing for chest that you're really wanting to know, am I doing it correctly? We have exercise execution and we talk specific mistakes that you might be making in that movement. But people will be out to the side and we'll talk about bringing their elbow down a little bit, but they'll keep their wrist turned out. So really making sure sure that this whole forearm is aligned. And if it's turning a little bit with the elbow, your hand is turning too, because that's going to cause so much more comfort. Uh, because also we see like the dumbbell holding off the side and that's causing like a lot of strain on your wrist. And I hear people most common complaints is I have pain in my shoulders or I have pain in my wrist. And then that ends up really holding them back from being able to perform those chest movements or progress within chest movements because of those simple mistakes. The last thing that I see is going to be weight selection. Because I think that some people maybe are nervous when they go to lay down on the bench of, can I get the dumbbells up here? Can I get them into a stable position to even start the exercise? Am I going to get stuck to this bench as soon as I lean back? And so I think that having the, the proper ability to kick the dumbbells up and into position is very important because um, going too light and then being in a situation where you're supposed to do eight reps where you could do 20 reps with the weight that you have in your hand is obviously not going to elicit the response that you're wanting to see. And so getting yourself set up in a very stable position and a confident position uh, to handle the weight that you have in your hands. Now I have one last question for you, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer after this whole podcast, but should women train their chest? They should. <laughs> they should. They, they very much so should. And again, if you guys have any other questions, we'll have those chest videos linked as well as another video going over why women should train chest and how important it is. So thank you guys so much for listening. Make sure you share this with a friend who might need to train their chest too, and we'll catch you in the next one.